Hi, welcome to the January 2023 first virtual reading and open mic. It's a pleasure to have you here, and we've got three wonderful features today Celeste Ganey, Joan Bauer, and Paul Tayar. And we're going to get started with our features in just a second. Um, our first feature today is Celeste Ganey, and she's the author of Gaffer, cited by the Oprah Magazine, otherwise known as O, as one of eight new books of poetry to save her in 2015. Graduating with a BFA in film and television from New York University, as well as an MFA in creative writing poetry from Carlo University. Ganey was the first woman to be admitted to the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees as a gaffer and has spent many years working with light in film and architecture, hence the title of her book. And I'm looking forward to hearing from her. Uh, thank you, Robbie, for uh, that introduction. And um, it's great to be here. I'm coming to you all from Pittsburgh. There are a couple of us. We That's how we're linked in to this group through Joan Bauer, who spends a lot of time in Pittsburgh. And I see Arlene uh, Weiner is on is on our, our Zoom too. So um, shout out from uh, a snowy day in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm going to start with some poems from my book, The Gaffer. Um, and as, as it's kind of obvious from my introduction, um, a gaffer is the chief lighting technician on a film set. But first, before that, before I was a gaffer, I was born in California, in Santa Barbara. And this first poem I'm going to read is an homage, really, to my parents' generation, um, they were you know, part of the great Midwest migration that came out to California after World War II and really began a whole new life. So this poem is for that generation and it's titled In the Land of Speculation and Seismography. In the land of speculation and seismography, there are dwellings made of future, low slung eaves and camphor wood structures, unspooling the coast like chambered fog, clinging to jutting scarps, glass front cantilevers containing lost Midwest revelers, unsuspecting under ceilings of roiling ocean waves. The first to make the scene strike a pose for modernity, sitting on air like stiffs, smiling at what, the sea? They would learn quickly to eat the whole enchilada with hot sauce, sip margaritas in the afternoon, listen nervously for the daylight down the tracks at the end of the day. High balls and hi-fi, haiku of the no ties, yes, my lifestyle. If this were the price to be paid for never waking to snow or leafless trees, walking upstairs, growing gray hair, all eyes ahead, boulevards of palm, dreams of dichondra, horizons of flagstone. Never mind the hobos by the bird refuge, rattlers in the foothills, children in the driveway, tremors on the fault line. So, uh, and thanks to, to Joan and uh, Paul, or Kareem, whatever you're feeling today, which name you're feeling, uh, for thinking of including me in this great group. And thanks to Robbie for including me. So this next poem, um, it's true, I, I was the first woman gaffer uh, in uh, Local 52 of Yahtzee in New York. And one of the films that I had um, the great uh, good luck to work on uh, was Dog Day Afternoon. I'm not, that was one of them, but I'm not reading that poem. I'm reading the poem. I, I got to work on Taxi Driver. Sorry, I kind of like, you know, switched those around. But uh, yeah, so I worked on Taxi Driver and this poem is about that experience. Uh, and it takes place 
uh, in Columbus Circle, at Columbus Circle in the summer of 1975. And um, this is how it goes, between takes. De Niro idles in his checker, Sybil flirts behind her Jackie O's. Scorsese sucks oxygen from a tiny tank trailed by an assistant. Albert Brooks hogs the PA. When using the moving sidewalk, please stand to the right. If you wish to pass, please do so on the left, over and over. Grips lay dolly track for a shot we all know will never make the final cut, but will take most of the day to shoot. Me in my 501s and Mighty Mouse t-shirt, 20 feet up, work gloves and pliers protruding, the brute arc light I tend sputters and hisses beside me. Like that famous New Yorker cover showing the world as seen from Ninth Avenue, the land of make-believe rises up to swallow me whole. I try to lean as if belonging against the unsteady rungs of my ladder, oblivious to the real world down there too, passing me by. Most jaded New Yorkers, their eyes on the prize, but maybe some looking up and wondering, what's that girl doing up there in the sky, flying so close to the sun? Some kind of myth with pliers. Uh, thank you. And um, now, um, I'm going to read a poem for um, Kareem. And, um, you know, I get Kareem's uh, newsletter, which is always a wonderful thing because usually it's in praise of something. And something that I need to remember is praiseworthy. So thank you, Kareem. So this kind of comes out from the, this poem was written in the same vein of remembering things, either past or even present, that we feel we need to acknowledge. And this is about a famed restaurant that we used to frequent <clears throat> once in a while when we'd get in the car and make that big drive down to Los Angeles from Santa Barbara. And I'm sure many of you know this restaurant too. And the title of the poem is the name of the restaurant, Tale of the Cock, where the margarita made its debut. There was one on La Cienega, another on Ventura Boulevard in the valley. Neon feathers animating up, then down, the booze always on the rocks, the steak three inch filet, bloody, onion rings on top, and Idaho baked in gold tin foil, swelling sour cream and chives on the side. You might stop before the long drive home. Pretty boy valets in cropped red jackets tempt you out in the port cachere. Inside a moment, dusk sifts in. The mater d at his podium, little pillow of light on his face, oversized menus, flocked covers, tassels swinging. He ushers you into the low ceilinged labyrinth, lodge of plush booths, tucked into nocturnal alcoves. Glow of tiny table lanterns bearding the famous faces. Everyone here to be seen, but hiding. The men look like Vic Damone, manicured nails, silk suits, and alligator loafers. The women like Angie Dickinson, too blonde, too beautiful, too smart for him. Two tables over, a crown of fire. The cherry's jubilee has been served. So now, uh, thank you. Now I'm going to um, read from something that's brand new, which is a chapbook called While We Were Waiting to Become Part of Our Century, which was just done by students at Pitt Greensburg in their class with Dave Newman. So we, we in Pittsburgh know Dave Newman and he uh, has a class where they, they teach them how to put together chapbooks and books of poetry. So I was very pleased that he asked me if I had poems and I, I have this beautiful book now, which is really great. So I'm gonna read <clears throat> actually 
uh, a poem that is the first poem in the book. Um, and it's called uh, Clubhouse Love. And for those of you um, who may be D David Bowie fans or Pet Shop Boy uh, fans, they, they make an appearance in this poem. Clubhouse Love. After the secret handshake recitation of favorite Moonrise Kingdom moments, we crank up the boombox, kick off our Timberlands and Joe Boxers, get down to it in our naughty pine forest of fornication. First, we lie side by side atop our stolen nano wave, 45 degree sleeping bag, stare up at all the glow in the dark stars. My left side completely touching your right side, your right hand completely clasping my left hand. We lie completely still, suctioned like this forever our own private Adirondack hearts, pulsing hard-ons, climbing. The pet shop boys stop being boring. David Bowie asks, where are we now? In both songs, there's a station, someone leaving with a haversack, some trepidation, pushing through the floorboards, poking our naked backs. The moment you know, you know, you know, we bolted through a closing door. And I'm going to end. Uh, thanks so much for uh, having me again and listening to me. And I love uh, meeting so many new faces, even if it is just virtual. That's part of the great thing that I can do that being so far away, right? So this is a poem. Uh, it's for Joan Bauer. And uh, Joan has heard this poem before. Uh, and so you're just going to have to listen to it again. But um, it's a newish kind of poem. and. Um, and I want to uh, I want to to read it out of thankfulness for Joan being my friend and also a great poet advocate. We we couldn't get along here in Pittsburgh without her. I'm telling you, she has a poetry blast, and you know that's how we all know what's what's up. Uh, so this poem is titled "The Last Stop Before the Sun Gives Up," and it has a um, it is for Joan Bauer and it has an epigraph, uh, which basically says with title and few words bor borrowed from John Recce. So those of you who know that author, uh, you might hear a few things that sound familiar. A person born and raised in mid-century Minnesota perceives differently from a person born and raised in mid-century Mississippi. And a person born and raised in mid-century Mississippi perceives differently from a person born and raised in mid-century California. The Beach Boys, Julia Child, Frank Bedart, Octavia Butler, Joan Didion are all born into this sunlight, as is Squeaky Fromm, as is Wanda Coleman, as is Eleni Sicilianos, as is the Johnny Cash tarantula. Later on, it would feel the same no matter where in America one is born and raised. But while it lasted, it was fun for each of us to be born into this geographic difference. Sunlight envelopes those living at the Western verge, but does so furtively. It wends from a source, but has no beginning nor end. It renders the foothills a shade of pink, matching the bumpy stucco exterior at my grammar school, the low wall running along Sycamore Canyon, the snack shack at Hope Ranch Beach, the Dumbo ride at Disneyland. As night falls, sunlight slips round the corner for another assignation, so torrid it travels in a little black dress. Day breaks over the coastline, Already the Mission Beige strip malls are oozing into their inadequate oil splotched parking lots. Try corralling that sunlight. It will ebb like surf from its briny shoreline or whiteness from the bluffs as the sun sets at Hollister Ranch or bounce blindingly off the titanium cladding on Gary's Disney Hall, then boomerang back off the alabaster road down the block. I once saw Hendrix before he was famous, smash his guitar on stage at Earl Warren Showgrounds in my hometown. What flashed out was a brilliance so bright, it still carouses my occipital lobe. 
But most of the time, the sunlight is flat, consuming, relentless, boring, really. No matter where you go up and down this coffin-shaped land, it will find you. Even Gertrude, as in Stein, the claim of California sunlight, there it is. It is there. And then eventually, is it there at all? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for your reading. Our next feature is Kareem Tayar and his novel, The Prince of Orange County, received the 2020 Eric Hoffer Award for Young Adult Fiction. In 2019, he received a Wurlitzer Poetry Fellowship. His work has appeared in literary journals such as Poetry Magazine, Prairie Schooner, Alaska Quarterly Review, and his most recent book is Keats in San Francisco and Other Poems, out now from Lily Poetry Review Books. I welcome Paul or Kareem, whichever you're in the mood for, Tayar. Thank you, Robbie. I appreciate that. And Celeste, it was wonderful to hear you read. That was, that was a, a, a real pleasure. This first poem is called Two Poets. The old man that I will someday be is sitting here at this very moment, writing a poem about the moon. Unless it's not about the moon, and it is actually about the night, and the moon is just here because it has to be, if one is to accurately describe a night like this one, which is exactly what the old man is attempting to do. Anyway, the old man wants to populate his poem of night with a few mermaids, several wild horses, a figure painter, his naked model, some falling stars, three aging acrobats, two young musicians, and the ghosts of Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, and his own grandparents, Frank and Eileen. It doesn't matter, the old man would like you to know what the poem is actually about, nor does it matter where it is set. All that matters is that everyone is here and that they are happy. This next poem is called, When You Arrive. When you arrive, tell the herdsman working beside the old well who your father was, and that you already know how to draw water from a buried source. Be prepared, especially in those early months, to find yourself speaking in a language you did not expect to ever hear again. Just as you should not be surprised if each time you try to sleep, the moon keeps changing shape while the clouds remain fixed in space. And if you begin to feel uncertain of whether the journey was worth it, you may find it helpful to remember that the stranger you have become to yourself is the man you were always meant to be, even if he answers to a name that you do not recognize. So this uh, uh, next poem is actually the first poem from my my most recent collection, um, and it was it was written uh, in uh, uh, it was it was inspired in a sense by um, a lot of the, the travel narratives and travel books that I've been reading, um, most notably uh, a kind of travel anthology that that Anthony Bourdain had had edited, and so this poem kind of came out of uh, an, ins an inspiration of the, the that particular text. This is called Advice for a Traveler. While walking across this planet, keep your eyes open for the six moons, each of whom shine in different shapes and sing in different octaves. There are many rivers on this planet, but only one sea. Sometimes the whales, tired of the taste of salt water, enter the rivers and imagine they are otters. When it rains on this planet, the bears believe it is their dancing that has made such an event possible. If a comet moves across the sky from east to west, the forest nymphs know it is time for the oldest of them to marry. The clouds are all edible here if you can reach them. Should you have any difficulty sleeping, a short prayer to one of the moons should do the trick. Which one in particular? It doesn't matter. They're all capable of magic. 
and they're all excellent listeners. Um, so this one, I early on in the pandemic, I unexpectedly um, adopted uh, a little kitten and, and she happened to be the, the first pet I'd ever had. Um, so it, it's just been an enormous amount of unexpected fun. So this is a, a poem kind of inspired by that. It's called Kitten. When I first bring you home, you remind me of an Ewok. One of those magical creatures who live in the enchanted moon forest of Endor and Return of the Jedi. Whether I'm Luke Skywalker or Han Solo in this context, I'm not sure. But I do know it means that no amount of gray hair can change the fact that I'm still the same boy I was nearly 40 years ago, when I first traveled to a galaxy far, far away and never completely returned. Uh, this poem is actually inspired by a few years back, I... Uh, got incredibly in, into um, the, the the jazz records of Sun Ra. I just found his work to be incredibly beautiful and um, enchanting. And, um, you know, he famously uh, insisted for the majority of his adult life that um, in his early 20s, he began to kind of travel to other planets. And then and those travels across the galaxy were what kind of inspired his greatest music. So this is called Sun Ra and his orchestra. I guess deep down, I always knew that outer space would sound like New York City on a Friday night. The comets and constellations all hurrying to catch their subways home in time to see the late innings of the Yankees game on television or the headliners set at the Apollo Theater. The moon shining above Lenox Avenue like an illuminated kick drum and the Ferris wheel rising from the outer cosmos of Coney Island like one of Saturn's orphaned rings. So uh, this poem is inspired by I, I I would I would call myself a perpetually below average guitar player, um, which I, I really enjoy playing, but I, I will never even be passable. Um, but but this poem is inspired by that. It's called Lazy Evening. It's been three hours and I'm still here, sitting on the sofa and playing country songs on an old acoustic guitar, and imagining I'm a middle aged John Prine. My voice is warm as a summer road trip where the windows are rolled down, the radio plays at high volume, and the woman in the passenger seat doesn't mind that I'm not ready to commit. So what that I've never owned a pair of cowboy boots, or that the closest I've come to riding a horse is the time I rented a Ford Mustang to drive from LA to San Francisco. Let me have this evening to believe that I've always been Nashville's favorite son, and that every love song Dolly Parton ever wrote was secretly about me. Um, this this one was inspired by um, I, I was I was raised in a, a, a very religious atmosphere. My my uh, mother is Irish Catholic and my father is Muslim, and so there was there was always kind of religion and spirituality and. Uh, you know, those kinds of conversations in the house very consistently. Um, and so this is a, a poem inspired by that. It's called A Brief Litany. Let the sky light its many blue candles. Let the river run backwards and rediscover its source. Let the mountains keep all of your secrets and let the birds in those mountains fly through the rain. Let the rain enter your windows each time you are writing a poem and let the ghosts on your rooftop howl each night at the moon. Let the winter you fear when no one is looking never come calling. And let the name that only the stars call you be the one only your lover says in your sleep. Um, so I'll, I'll just close with um, these last two. Um, this one's called Wool Gathering. Lately, I've begun counting sheep in the daytime. It's nice, especially on an afternoon like this one, bumper to bumper on a freeway that feels thousands of miles from any pasture. The sheep all seem to understand. They gather around me as I offer my recitations and listen with the patience of saints. Later, we move deeper into the hills together and I let them lead. 
they know where the river is and how much further before we arrive at the temple of stars. All right, and this, this last one, uh, living for, for the entirety of my life in Southern California, um, snow for the most part has been kind of an, ab an abstraction. <laughs> and so uh, I find that the, the most time I've spent in the snow is really just in the poems that I write. So I'll, I'll, I'll close with this one. This is called The Book of Snow. The Book of Snow keeps my secrets too. What winter night I first undressed beneath the names of my early poems, the ones that never left my drawer. That dream I keep having where my feet become water and then stone and then finally sand. The precise location of my father's grief and my mother's longing. There is frost on my window in the shape of an egret. Outside the trees have begun to button their winter coats and apply their makeup. I feel like an angel but it seems like everything around me has already been blessed. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you so much, Paul, that was lovely. Thank you, Robbie, I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to meet you. I think, do you live in Orange County? I do, I live in Newport Beach. Uh, so uh, kind of Southern Orange County towards the water, yeah. So we're almost neighbors. Oh, where are you? Lake Forest. Oh, totally neighbors. I didn't realize that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See you around when I start going to live events again, which may be a while. Our next feature and our last one for today is Joan Bauer, who... Um, recommended the other two features and I'm grateful to her for that and for other things. She's the author of two poetry collections, The Almost Sound of Drowning from Main Street Rag in 2008, Camera Artist, Turning Point 2021. For some years, she worked as an English and journalism teacher and an educational counselor. Recent work has appeared in Patterson Literary Review, Slipstream and Chiron Review. Three of her poems have been nominated for a push card. She divides her time between Venice, California, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That seems to be the theme of today, where she co hosts and curates the Hemingway's Summer Poetry Series with Christopher Collins. Her new book of poetry, Fig Season, is forthcoming from Turning Point this year. So let's hear from Joan. Well, gosh, thank you. Thank you so much, Celeste and Kareem. I'm so happy to be reading with you. Thank you so much, um, Robbie, for this opportunity to share our work. Um, and thanks to all of our friends who are on this call, um, who are on the Zoom. I'm going to read, um, actually, I would just have to say that um, I'm going to read just one poem from The Camera Artist, which is which came out in January of 2021, and you can't quite see her, but that's Dorothea Lang on the um, top of a car. She's about to go out and um, do some, some photography that will be, uh, become iconic photographs of the Depression and um, and some other subjects, and this book has a lot to do with photography. I'm only going to read one poem because I'm from this because I want to read a few from Fig Season, which is about everything Italian, um, and then something else. But um, I owe a much better title to this poem that I'm going to read to Celeste Ganey, who helped me with this manuscript, as did several other people on this call. And she said, I think I know a better title for this one. <laughs> okay. Picture perfect. That's the sofa where my sister and I practiced standing on our heads. There the pages opened to Chopin on the dusty upright where my mother tried to teach us, but we were stubborn and lazy. On the bookcase, 36 volumes of Funk and Wagnalls for the children and a raft of self-help books, which my mother read. 1956 was the year my father 
nearly packed his gray suits, socks, and slide rule for London and some British woman. Rooms half lit, Venetian blinds closed to the neighbors and the beauty of azaleas. Only his father's protests convinced him to stay. There's the backyard where I found my mother crying and cursing at the clothesline and the kitchen where she stood boiling chicken and potatoes. She was Italian, but had no love for the tomato. Dad wasn't home for dinner anyway, working months at some Mojave missile site, or maybe Chquagiline, Chquagiline, in the hallway, the canaries. In my cluttered bedroom, small desk and chair, dictionary, baby blue wallpaper with little roses, my schoolwork and chicken scratch. I remember how despite her travails, my mother defended me when my teachers complained of my failure to engage my thumb properly while holding a pencil and all those times they chastised me for daydreaming and rolling my eyes. After my father left for the last time, my mother learned to cook Chinese. It wasn't half bad. So in May, um, I will have a third book and it's um, inspired by my Italian heritage, um, which is I'm half Italian, actually Sicilian um, from near Palermo. And so I thought maybe it was time to pay some attention to all that. And so here are some poems about all things Italian, with more to come. La Lupa, please don't retouch my wrinkles. It took me so long to earn them. Anna Magnani, strange to feel so drawn these days to the she-wolf, the earth mother, the wild rose of Italian cinema, Magnani, abandoned by her unmarried mother, grew up a big boned girl with fierce eyes in the slums of Rome, sang in tawdry nightclubs with that low and earthy contralto. Over the years, she'd play Henri's Medea, wrecked Mother Courage. O'Neill's Anna Christie, she'd throw spaghetti at Roberto Rossellini before or maybe after he threw her aside for Ingrid Bergman. When her only son, Luca, was struck down by polio, she, looked, she worked like a donkey in every film she could to provide. She complained. Everyone saw her as some sullen, lonely Electra, but she loved being Anna Magnani, laughing, joking through it all. In the rose tattoo with Burt Lancaster, who did not impress her, she plays a widowed seamstress undone by grief, then revived by passion for Lancaster's dumb trucker. Tennessee Williams gave her this knowing line, he has the body of my husband and the head of a clown. So in reading, um, in thinking about how to write about all things Italian, I did quite a dive into Italian cinema. And um, among the, the, the directors and actors and writers I came upon and learned a lot about was Pasolini. And here's a poem in his honor. And Pasolini and the elegiac heart. For Pasolini's, the gospel according to, in Pasolini's, the gospel according to St. Matthew, Jesus is played by a heavy browed economic student and Mary at the crucifixion is portrayed by the director's mother. Pasolini was fervently religious as a child, then atheist. He stumbled onto the, he stumbled onto the gospels in an Assisi hotel room and conceived of a contemplative film without embellishment. A gay Marxist, a poet inspired by Rambeau, he devoured Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Shakespeare, had his first homoerotic attraction working as a teacher. Charged with corruption of minors, he lost his job. 
moved to Rome writing novels, plays, poems, scripts for Fellini, then directed Pacatoni about prostitutes and thieves, the grimmest movie one critic had ever seen. He directed Anna Magnani as Mama Rose, Marie Callas as Medea. He had an actor's rugged face with deep set eyes in his reverential masterpiece, Baby Jesus Meets Three Wise Men to the tune of Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. Then the radical stoop-shouldered Jesus is crucified. Assassination at 53. Pasolini's battered body found in a field near Ostia. Pino the frog took the rap, served nine years, then claimed he'd only been the bait. Spoke of Southern Italians who spat dirty communists on the dying man. But then, as Pasolini foretold, I love life so desperately, no good can come of it. And um, a poem about an actress and director and really pioneer in cinema, whose face I'm sure you've seen. Hold the knife this way. The lady director in pink flacks, straw hat and cowboy boots would say, hold the knife this way and make sure we can see that lovely meat hook. Ida Lupino, queen of the B movies, bogey's girl in High Sierra, so convincing as a convict, a gangster mall, a neurotic, pioneering director, screenwriter, master of the camera angle, the social message movie, ballsy gal. Everyone liked her, the whole crew. But she didn't like being called hard luck Lupino, though she was taking projects to keep her actor husband, Howard Duff, working, who never quite gave up the bachelor life. When she was old, she would stand in her garden and spray her neighbors with a hose. As a critic once said of her acting, Miss Lupino goes crazy about as well as it can be done. Then, um, then um, those of you who are in Pittsburgh know about Box Populi, a public sphere for poetry, politics, and nature, a wonderful online journal um, published, curated by Michael Sims, former um, founder of Autumn House Press. He's been a big friend of, to me. Um, and so many of my poems are on that website. Um, it's just um, unbelievable how many of them he's taken, particularly some of the longer historical poems and some of the shorter historical poems. Um, um, so here's one that was just on last week. They left Chicago behind. Saul Bellow called Chicago a prairie city with a waterfront and the trees he remembers, elms and cottonwoods. He was an intellectual. Not so Jean and Dora, my husband's parents, each the youngest and most put upon in their big and quarrelsome families. Perhaps Jean and Dora read Dreiser and Dos Passos, probably not Marx and Engels or Andre Gide. They were distantly related to Bello. They had aspirations for college, for more than a factory job. But after the war, Jean wasn't the same. In 1953, Dora was selling girdles door to door so they could flee Chicago snow at stockyards and tenements for California. That year, Saul Bellow, teaching at Princeton, entertained John Berryman and Edmund Wilson. Later, my husband, Paul, said he couldn't understand how his cousin Saul could depict, depict their Aunt Zelda in Herzog as a crass and two-faced housefrau with gold slacks and shiny 
plastic shoes. Paul would say, honest, that wasn't who she was. And then I will close with a poem and this last poem and then this one now are part of something new I'm working on called um, Circling Toward Home. And, um, and it's probably a shout out to, to my cousin, Alan, who is in uh, Joshua Tree and whose beautiful, amazing art is the cover for Fig Season. And so, yay, Alan, thank you. I hope to see you soon. After a sign in Joshua Tree, tortoise crossing. I'm not a rock climber. I don't eat psychedelics. I never wore tie dye, even in the 60s. I'm not a ufologist. I never probed a mine shaft or, or owned a quartz pole. But last spring, at the crossroads of the Mojave and Colorado deserts, I found the magic scarf. The bristly armed Joshua can live 500 years. Moths lay eggs on their green white flowers. First to see the otherworldly yucca hunter gatherers when the sluggish river still crossed the Mojave. Later, Mormon settlers named the trees for their biblical Jesus, their biblical Joshua, lifting his hands to heaven. Then came the gold miners who dug and dug, hellbent with pickaxe and shovel, leaving behind their shanty towns. At Joshua Tree Inn, a shrine to Graham Parsons, who died there at 26. Of a, from a stupendous load of morphine and booze. We stayed once in room eight where he's memorialized with birds posters, beer bottles, guitar picks, vinyl, and sage. We now stay at the budget safari inn where Ravi and Jasmine are gracious. The king bed is firm, the room clean and modest, at night, we drive beyond the town's lights to stargaze. In the desert, I'm a tortoise with a magic scarf. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our features. Really enjoyed that. Um, let it get away a little bit. So um, make sure uh, that you on the open mic, uh, please stick to the five minute or two poems, whichever comes first rule. All right. Thank you. That's, Our first open mic reader is Mark Petrie. Hello, everybody. Uh, I don't know how to follow up that. That was a marvelous, marvelous read. I'm just happy to be here to hear such wonderful talent. Uh, I'm going to go from Italy to France right now. Uh, this is one of my favorite books, Parole par uh, Jacques Prévert. And I just had a poem that I translated, uh, Barbara by Jacques Prévert. It's going into the Alchemy uh, Review of uh, Translations published by UC Estine, uh, I think next month. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to read Barbara, because I'm not sure everyone knows the poem Barbara. Then I'm gonna read my, my small translation based on it. Uh, in my translation, there's three people you have to know about. One is uh, Charles Trenet who, who wrote the song La Mer. Please do me a favor. Everyone listen to Charles Trenet sing La Mer. Edith Pia, uh, the small sparrow who was one of the great poets and singers of all time and was a prostitute in um, Le Havre before she came famous. And my aunt, uh, Jean Morlay, who was the was uh, recorded on the first um, uh, recording of operas in France in 1913. So first I'm gonna read Barbara, then I'm gonna read my short translation. Barbara, remember the rain was falling all that day on breast and you were walking, smiling, 
radiant, full of joy, streaming wet in the rain. Barbara, remember, all day the rain fell on breast. I ran into you on the Rue de Siam. You were smiling and I was smiling too. Barbara, remember, I didn't know you. You didn't know me, remember? You should remember that day all the same. Don't forget, a man was sheltering in a porch and he called out your name, Barbara, and you ran towards him in the rain, steaming wet, full of radiant joy, and you threw yourself into his arms. Barbara, remember that. Don't be cross if I'm direct. I can't be bothered with niceties. When I love someone, even if I've seen them only once, I'm never formal with people in love, even if I've not met them before. Barbara, remember, don't forget that wet, wise, happy rain on your happy face, on that happy town, that rain on the sea, on the munitions dump, on the U-boats. Oh, Barbara, what a bloody waste war is. Where the hell are you now? Under the downpour of iron, of fire, of steel, of blood. And the man you hugged in your arms, full of love, did he die, disappear, or is he still alive? Oh, Barbara, it rains and rains on breast as it rained before, but it's not the same anymore and all is ruined. It's the desolate rain of bereavement, no longer even the same thunder of iron, of steel, of blood, but simply clouds going under like dead dogs disappearing, floating downstream out of breast to rot far, far away from breast, of which there's left nothing. That's the poem, Barbara. And this is my uh, poem. I'm, called, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. Um, you're out of time. I'm at I 3.37. I had 3.37. Oh, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah can I, I? I'm running a little fast. All right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, this is a quick poem after Barbara. Barbara, you no longer exist like Jacques Prévert, like the war, like Brest. The city remains as true, though truly most has been replaced by concrete and steel. And you raised a family? Maybe, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little shaken. Maybe you raised a family? We don't know, but it's all the same. The poem, Barbara, remains. The songs of Tene Piaf. Montan and my great aunt, Jane Morlay. You can hear them all on YouTube. I read Jacques Prévert and I think of you. You know, Barbara, the Nazis returned. They marched in the middle of a street in uh, the United States and chanted, Jews will not replace us. And the war returned. It has begun in the Ukraine. Now that most of the world has forgotten the last one, the oceans remain and the rain, but it's not Trinae's ocean. It is a dying acidic sea with plastics, losing slowly its currents. Its waters are warming, melting ice, waters that rise each day, each month, each year. Breast will drown in the sea. Nothing is as it was, Barbara. Okay. Our, our next reader is Kenneth Wing. Thank you for having me today. I'm going to read two poems. Uh, the first is after Jeremiah 3115. And it was written after the killings in Uvalde in Texas. A voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children. She refuses to be comforted because her children are no longer. Did they cry for their mothers, pray to a God, ask for mercy? Perhaps they died without a sound, not a whimper or tear. Nobody talks about their actual deaths, about this slaughter of innocence. We remember them for their could have beens, hopes, wishes, childhood dreams, delusions of a better place where children are safe from madmen's hands. This one an athlete, another a chef, this one perhaps a dancer, poet, doctor, nurse, a writer of tales, a lover of dogs, 
now bloodied and their faces blown away. Did they wonder why their fathers did not come? Did they shudder at the popping sounds? Did their dying bodies jerk about the classroom's cold vinyl floor? I wonder if they cried in pain. Can we explain to them why that madman came to school that day? And the second one is called Of Prayers and Rhymes. <clears throat> A gray brown dove took residence beside our stairs, settling with one last wings flutter. She had taken final wounded refuge there. Then stirring from time to time with stricken coos, she made it clear that her demise was coming near. I saw her steer, stir from time to time and wondered if I might give her a quick release or by chanting prayers and happy rhymes, I could perchance relieve her tremid fears. Instead, I stood above and mimed my sad farewell and kissed the desert ear. In the end, mortality took her soul away and left her down and feathered body for decay. Thank you. Our next reader is our estimable editor, Jim Lewis. I have two short poems to share today. One from my experiences working as a nurse practitioner in the county jail, and it's called Have a Blessed Day. Junkie, joker, con man, thief, parade of ailments large and small, daily sameness, interspersed with moments of intervention, the kind that saves a life, at least for now. And in the least expected moments on a single weary day, surprising phrases reprised not by the healer, the giver, but by the grateful takers who bring their simple ills to his feet and parting offer him a respite from it all. Have a nice day, have a blessed day. God bless you. Blessings on you. Blessings. And then the second poem is also from the healthcare field, but it's a personal from me to my, about my last experience seeing my primary care physician, and it's called Checkup. I tell him I had COVID almost a year ago. He nods and says, yes, it's in my record. He asks what my concerns are though that is in the secure message I sent him days ago. We talk, or at least I complain, he listens. Easy fatigue, no stamina, vertigo, lack of focus. I thought he was listening, but he asks instead about my depression and if the medication helps. Yes, yes, I tell him it works, but these symptoms started long before the blues, so no, not that. And then it starts. EKG, treadmill stress test, pulmonary function test, vials and vials of blood, every test, every sample, every result comes back. I'm in good shape for an old coot. And yet the symptoms are still there. Walk a block in a mask and stop to huff, puff and rest. Climb one flight of stairs, pant for breath. Nothing gets better, nothing gets easier. So what's an old geezer to do when the checkup says, I'm fine, but my body disagrees? What's next? What is coming next? Thank you. Thank you. Our next open mic reader is Dick Westheimer, and he is going to share his screen. So I've made him co-host for the moment. I have the power. And James, my experience is that NPs listen better than MDs. Um, so this first one um, is going to be a short poem. Um, I have entered it into the tribute I guess, contest that Rattle's having to crypto poets. And I'm actually going to play for you my crypto poem, 
uh, which I've had a good time sort of exploring this new world. So here is this one, and you won't hear me, but you'll hear me. Here we go. Sometimes a poem, sometimes a poem just wants to go out on the town, draw a pink boa around its neck, sip some gin. Sometimes it wants to show a little skin, flash a bare leg, make the boys swoon, and other times wear its mini pearl hat with its price tag dangling down. And sometimes a poem just wants to lounge around in sweats and fuzzy slippers, pop open a brew or two, speak in few words, listen to its heart beat, and maybe yours, its head on your chest, whispering. So that's that one. And uh, the second one is, uh, I have to fulfill my responsibility to read a poem from my upcoming chapbook. Uh, the proceeds go to Trust Train Ukraine. I'll put a link to the charity in my, um, in my, uh, uh, in the chat. And this one, uh, this is a picture of Volodymyr Zelensky when he first went to Buka and saw the carnage, horror, torture, mass graves there. And the poem is called Witness the Warring Lords and the Forever Price. And it's uh, taken from Genesis 1913, the story of Lot and his wife and daughters. In the beginning, it was Lot and his daughters, his unnamed wife, those damnable angels. Sodom, Gomorrah, Burka, Erpine, it's all the same. Slaughter, panic, outrage, shame. This is the stuff of endless lists, the kind and number of disjointed bones, the chromatone of burning flesh, the breadth and width of skin as measured in pain. Kids skin knees not kissed, scabs unpicked, toys crushed, the unnamed babies who will never go to war, the named ones who will. I ripped that page from my embattled Bible. Overhead, a lone goose sounds like two Call, response, call, response, so alone. I look back to the remains of the terrible book. There, the limitless victims, the nameless wife, I will call Sela. Her life as witness as she considers the Immolet sisters, the lone goose, the good, the vagrant, the lascivious, the chaste. Her gaze stays fixed on the crime, forever tied to the chasm sky. She sees the hand that re hands that reach from the graves, the broken crutches, how blue the fire burns, how blackened the flesh, the dirt beneath the fingernails of the dead, the sins that are not sins, the sins that are, the gods who worship their own idols, the idols made in the image of their savage gods. Only Sela looks back. She knows the price. She chooses to be a pillar of salt. Thank you. And I'll put the links in the in the um, to the book in the uh, and the charity in the chat. Thank you so much. I've heard it before, but it's wonderful, and I never get tired of it. So our next person at the open mic who is also going to share a screen is Robert Dean. So I have to on co-host Dick and find Robert. Because you can't do several at a time. It won't let you. There you go. So go ahead, Robert. Where are you, Robert? 
I see, still see Dick. I see Robert's share screen, but I don't hear him. Are you unmuted, Robert? Let's see. No, I was having a problem unmuted there. Okay. Can there you go. Now? Okay. You should be seeing just a, like an old style payphone on your screen. So I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, I'm doing this because so many of you are from Pittsburgh, and I'm hoping that some of you are familiar with a Pittsburgh writer named Jason Baldinger, uh, who in addition to being a fine poet is also known for his excellent black and white photography. He goes out and takes photos of kind of falling down, tumbling down kind of places in rural areas. And he and I are working on a project, his photos, my words, and we hope to do a chat book of it. Um, uh, two of them have been published last month in a fantastic review. This is one of them. He just titles his photos according to where he took them. And I'm only going to read the one, the one piece. And the poem I wrote to this is called The Hang Up. He took the photo in Walkersville, West Virginia. So this is The Hang Up. They hear it in Ohio, Pennsylvania, cotton fields of the Llano Estacado. The gator lands of South Florida, the bottom of Crater Lake, tsunami warning sign, siren across the Pacific, three mountains in the Hindu Kush implode, blood stains your connection to civilization. You didn't know Bakelite could cut so deep. It's 1983 and she's told you don't call her again, no matter if you're lost in the woods in Hicksville or wherever, falling off a cliff. Sinking in quicksand, goodbye, good riddance, good God. Hasn't she had enough, haven't you? And here you are, four decades, three divorces, two heart attacks, six grandkids later, a middle of nowhere return, sanity hanging by a thread. You wish you could pick it up, put it back together, punch the right numbers, say I'm sorry, wondering, isn't life funny? How you found it again? How this thing is still here? Your anger, your hang up, if only you'd known. Leaves rustle, wind blusters in the open window. You start the car, head for the interstate, that lunatic asylum you saw in Weston. Shuttered now, tourists and ghost hunters only, poems of the lost tattooed on therapy room walls. You happen to have a crayon on you. In the rear view, the phone rings. That's it, that, I'm only gonna read that one. The, there's this one and another one can be found at the Ekfrastic Review. I think we've got nine done all together. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next person at the open mic is Rosemary Bohm. I'm happy to read, but would you please stop the screen sharing? Oh, yes. Sorry. He could have done that, but uh, yeah. that's okay. Now... I was reading, I was going to read something else, but with Celeste and the film uh, poems, I just couldn't resist. Uh, I have lived near and in the film industry for many years, and I have written this one, which I think um, is probably quite enjoyable. It's from my book, The Rain Girl, and it's called It's a Wrap. Eight months, three days, and four hours. Pre-production not included. Actors arrived, set designer and his crew, costume ladies, makeup, hair, director, of course. Locals hovered. Did you see him? Gorgeous. She is just adorable. So friendly, wouldn't have thought. A few more weeks. Greta hated that bitch Mylene who, was, who always made her look bad. Stephen's boyfriend couldn't make it. No one else on the set, can you believe this? The leads had been into each other from when they shot the seduction scene. Limited crew. The director got close. The camera a close-up. Liaison brought in more condoms. The German guy is hot. They're queuing to get laid. Holy dickhead, this is nothing. Did you crew on heaven's gate? 
Last day of shoot. It's in the bag. Brushes look good. Wrap party. Champagne. Sandwiches without crusts, white powder. Annie wears almost a skirt. Jason lies stoned in a corner of changing room number two. Back home, will they understand complicity, proximity, and pheromones? <laughs> and the other one is more gentle. That's from my book, Saudade, that's just come out from Kelsey Books. Fading. You must remind me of the good times. Before we went to sleep and turned away, before you asked me not to leave you, before I had to get drunk on those nights, I knew I couldn't say no. Remind me of the times you walked naked to the kitchen at three in the morning in that awful flat you shared just to take all the pips out of watermelon slices and feed me cheese and juicy sweetness singing Teddy Bear's Picnic. Of the day you came to meet me at the port and how you rested on the embankment while I cleaned the spark plugs. Remind me of the scary film when you held my hand or of the laughter when we married. You got a potted plant from the pet shop and cut off the flowers so I would have a bouquet. Remind me, because how else can I tell the children that they were conceived in love? Thank so you. So sweet. That is so sweet. Thank you so much. That's rare. Our next reader is Alicia Vigor Esper. Hello. I'm new here, so um, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And I wonder whether I could share the screen. It will help with my accent. Go ahead. Can you see this? Can you see it? Can you see the page? No. Ah, great. Okay. Do you know how to do it? Yeah, yeah. Alicia? For some reason, okay. it just didn't work. I don't know. Okay, let me try. Okay, I'm just going to read it. So you'll deal with my accent. Uh, this is a poem that I wrote. It's a real experience that I had in Afghanistan years ago, and I find it very puzzling and interesting. I was published in, in Panoplasin as the uh, editor's choice this year. It's called Sand. And it's a, a non-traditional hybrid. Confronted with a sea of bleak, monotone beige, I thought about my childhood golden dunes and El Saler Beach covered by Pancratian Pancratian Maritimus blooms overlooking the sea's impossible shades of turquoise. Here, the colors were excised. How the bus driver stay on the road was a mystery since it often appeared hidden by sand. I couldn't understand why he stopped, but then a man stepped on the metal rooms, nodded, and without words sat down on the floor since there were no empty seats. Through the glassless windows, I searched for a hamlet, a caravan, a truck, a donkey, anything that could have brought these men to these not existing bus stops in the desert. Nothing, nobody seemed surprised or even curious. The bus maintained its course south of Kandahar to Kandahar, Herat, long gone. The new traveler's complexion of almond shells remind me of Jesus with his dark mustache below calm, warm eyes. I consider whether the Christian rabbi had worn a turban, but when I saw the man wiping fine sand dust off his face with the turban's tail, I decided that yes, he must have needed one. Nothing happened for the next hour until the traveler without a seat leaned his head and arm on the lap of the man next to him and closed his eyes. 
To my amazement, they never spoke, never made eye contact. Both pretended that the fact that one man took another body's part as pillow for his comfort never happened. Or more likely, I witnessed something beyond my Western comprehension. I thought of Jesus again following the same silk road as Alexander, crossing the treacherous fiber pass on his way to India, saying, the son of man has no place to lay his head. But someone, without lifting his arms to stop the bus, without paying the fare or taking or talking to anyone, found a place to lay his head. Dusk, desert sand, a man leans on the lap of infinite. Dusk, desert sand, a man leans on the lap of infinite. Uh, let's see if I can get the other one. Hmm. Okay, it's not happening. So I'm going to read it too. Uh, this other one was recently published in Live Encounters. It's a shorter one, Doves in the Botanical Gardens. I hear cooing from doves above my window, loud, rhythmic, like in those days when they called for mates in the botanical gardens. The sun already bright behind birch, trees reflected on the square pond, your hands resting on my shoulder as we sat on the wooden bench. We walk among perennials, roses, citric orchards, sequoias. The queen follow us through narrow dusty paths, beds of herbs. We identify the medicinal ones, valeriana and salvia officinalis, macromeria fructicosa, rosmarinus. Some mimic it poison threads or disposition we possess. You, Nerion oleander, we call adelphas, I, Rooks, Tuxicodendrum, poison ivy. We knew to touch or being touched by these venomous plants will cost us painful blisters, but we couldn't stop from exploring. And our hands danced repetitively to the dove's crescendo until we made each other sick. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I hope you'll come back another time. Yeah, I don't, but you did hear, you didn't see me or see the. No, I didn't see anything. Okay. Just you, just you. Are you here? Right, thank you. Yeah, but I have to go on to the last person. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Our last person at the open mic today is Margaret Duda. Welcome back, Margaret. Ah, thank you so much. Um, and today I'm coming from State College, Pennsylvania, only three hours from Pittsburgh. Um, and today I'm going to read a poem that was in Lothorian recently and will be in my uh, book coming out in May with Kelsey called I Come From Immigrants. And this is a picture of my mother at 17. And the poem is it's called Coming to America. On the Bremen Pier, bustling with noisy immigrants, my mother finds a ticket office and stands in a line for Hungarians. Ticket in one hand, heavy satchel in the other, warm shawl around her thin shoulders. Margaret views her new reflection in the large window. Straight dark hair she cut to just below her earlobes, trying to look American for her waiting mother. Gone the waist length braid that took years to grow. The shipping clerk shouts, next, and she moves to the counter, offering the prepaid ticket sent by her mother. He asks for her sponsor, but none was mentioned in the letter sent with the ticket. Anyone under 18 needs a sponsor. She explains she will turn 18 in a week. You cannot take this ship. Rules are rules. Margaret's shoulders shake with her heavy sobs. The old woman behind her with long white hair braided around her head offers to sponsor her. They both have second class tickets and can share a cabin. The disgruntled clerk stamps both tickets. On board the huge iron hulled steamship, they find their room. 
Margaret takes the upper bunk, giving Mrs. Ola the bottom, marveling at the sink with running water in their cabin. The rumbling engines groan, the horns bellow, the ship leaves the dock and the prow slides through the Atlantic, heading toward the setting sun. Margaret leads her sponsor outside for a final glance. She hears a violin playing a Hungarian folk tune, sees dancing and steerage. We should be there too, Mrs. Ola chuckles. Within two days, Margaret can keep nothing down as winds hurl the ship through tall swells. Four days later, the winds calm and Mrs. Ola wishes her a happy birthday, offering her a small wrapped box. Inside, Margaret finds a locket on a gold-plated chain for a photo of your mother who is waiting for you. In the dining room that evening, Margaret wears her gifts as waiters singing happy birthday approach her with a cake and 18 lit candles. Others join in. She blows out her candles as a messenger calls her name. She raises her hand and he places a telegram in it. Your mother must have remembered. Margaret asks Mrs. Ola to read the English message. She reads it silently then leads Margaret outside to two deck chairs. She takes her hand. Your mother died last night, child. She was very ill. Margaret screams. First, she was left in an orphanage and now abandoned in a strange country. I will be alone again. No, your stepfather will meet you. I must return to Hungary. Mrs. Ola shakes her head. Impossible, the ticket costs too much. But I must, Rosanini was the only mother I knew who loved me. I never heard my mother's voice or even saw her smile. If you want to hear her speak, listen to your own voice. If you want to hear her smile, look in a mirror. A woman carried you in her womb. For nine months, you were one. Now you must carry her in your heart and make her proud. Margaret watches dense sea fog slither over the ship's railing and silently glide toward them. Hearing the baritone blast of the foghorn, she wipes away her tears and leads her sponsor back inside, knowing she must find the courage to survive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank Thanks. you to everyone at the open mic and to our features. And thank you for being here. If you're listening, we need an audience. So please come back another time and listen in to other readings on the archive. And this one will be up in probably in a few days. All right. Thanks so much. And probably. see you next month. Robbie. Yeah. Before you end, let me just put in a plug for our first book party of the year, which is next Saturday. We are all booked up for authors presenting, but we always need an audience, and you can find information on the Burst Virtual website.